Hi, my name is Shalom Patel from Duke University and I'm also a Grouper developer. I'm going to be talking about Grouper maintenance. The purpose of this section is to explain what administrators will typically have to do in order to maintain their Grouper instance. Here are the contents of this section. I'll start off by talking about how to prune some old data. This includes audit logs as well. Then I'll cover Grouper diagnostics along with the Grouper report. I'll talk about a couple of utilities that are part of Grouper, and then I'll talk about login configuration, and then I'll talk about adding new loader jobs, and finally about helping developers and architects. There are going to be a lot of different types of old data that you may want to delete over time. The first example is deleting unused folders. There may have been an application-specific folder that was used in the past and is no longer needed. Or another example is if you're loading course data with instructor and student groups for each course, for instance, and you only need to keep a specific number of old terms around in Grouper. There are various different ways to delete this old data, but the easiest is probably using the obliterate stem gsh command. This operation will delete the specified stem along with all the objects nested within that stem. So that may include groups, other folders, and so forth. This is different from the del stem gsh command in that that command will only delete a stem if it's empty. The obliterate stem gsh command has a few parameters. The first is the stem name that you want to delete. The second is whether you're just doing a test and want to print out what would be deleted. And the third is whether you want to also delete point in time data for objects within the specified stem. But note that in order to delete data from point in time audit, the object deletions have to be processed by the changelog daemon first, which runs every minute by default. So a typical usage would be to first run the command with the test only boolean set to true and the point in time boolean set to false. If the output looks okay, run it again but with the test only boolean set to false. Finally, after waiting for the changelog daemon to process the delete, if you also want to delete the data from point in time, run the command again but with the point in time boolean set to true. Although in many cases, you may actually not want to delete the data from point in time at the same time. The second type of old data that you may want to delete is user audit. The user audit in Grouper covers the high level updates that have happened. As of Grouper 2.1, the user audit is not deleted automatically, but it's still very easy to delete. The audit data is kept in the Grouper underscore audit underscore entry table in the database. The table has a created on column which stores the time when the audit entry was logged in milliseconds from EPECT. So if you want to just delete old user audit based on a certain date, uh, you can easily run the SQL command like the one shown in the slides, which would delete all the user audit before January 1st, 2012. The next type of old data that you may want to delete is point in time audit. The point in time audit allows you to query the state of Grouper on a specific point of time or a date range in the past. I already covered how this can be done using the obliterate stem gsh command, but here's another method along with more information. So point in time audit in Grouper is stored in the tables that have names starting with Grouper underscore PIT underscore. In Grouper 2.1, there are 14 of these tables. Audit data can be deleted from point in time if the associated objects have been deleted and processed by the changelog daemon. Here are a couple of examples of deleting point in time data. The first example is to delete point in time data based on a date. The example uses the current time, so all objects deleted before the current time would get deleted from point in time. You can specify a date in the past if you want to delete point in time data for objects that have been deleted before some date in the past. The second example allows you to delete old data based on a stem. So this is very similar to the obliterate stem gsh command. You probably also want to make sure that old changelog data gets deleted. Grouper stores incremental changes in a table so consumers can get the updates in near real time. The changelog data is already deleted by default by the Grouper daemon, um, and by default, 14 days of changelog data is retained. But you can update that in the Grouper loader uh, properties file. Daemon logs are also stored in the database. Log entries are created whenever various daemon jobs run, including the changelog daemon, uh, the job to maintain rules in Grouper, and loader jobs, among other things. By default, seven days of daemon logs are retained, but again, this is configurable in the grouper loader.properties file. The next topic is grouper diagnostics. If you're running grouper in production, you can have your monitoring software, such as Nagios, hit the grouper diagnostics page every so often to make sure that there are no major issues. This basically reports on the health of grouper and is part of grouper web services. It performs various checks, including making sure 
that you have free memory available, making sure that there aren't any connection issues with the grouper registry, making sure that there aren't any connection issues with any of your subject sources, and finally, making sure that all of uh, the daemon jobs have had at least one success recently. You're able to exclude specified daemon jobs as well if you'd like. In the end, if everything looks okay, then a 200 HTTP code is returned. Otherwise, a 500 HTTP code is returned. I've included a link here uh, for the Grouper Diagnostics wiki page, which has more information on the configuration options. The next item is the Grouper report. Uh, the Grouper report runs as part of the Grouper daemon and is configured in the Grouper loader.properties file. Some of the properties that are related to the Grouper report are included here. You can basically specify when you want the report to run based on a uh, quartz cron syntax. You can also specify an, an email address if you want the report emailed. And you can specify a directory where you want a report saved. The grouper report basically provides information about your grouper instance. For instance, it'll tell you how many groups, folders, members, and memberships you currently have. It'll also tell you about recent changes. It will also report if there are any unresolvable subjects in your grouper registry, along with if there are any bad memberships. Both of these are covered briefly in the next couple of slides. And finally, it will also inform you if there are any daemon jobs with failures. Um, and if there are failures, you can query the database for more information about the failure, including a stack trace. The SQL I'm, I've included here will return all the job instances that have not succeeded, ordered by the date starting with the most recent. The bad membership finder utility is used to find bad, bad memberships and group sets. Uh, for example, it's possible for composite groups to end up having incorrect memberships if there are multiple changes happening with groups that make up the composite at about the same time. Also, it's possible for effective group sets to get out of sync, again, if multiple related changes are happening together. These types of issues are fairly uncommon, but since they're possible, we have the utility to fix the issues. The utility will run out of the grouper report uh, by default, or you can run it manually using GSH. The utility itself does not make any changes to your grouper registry, but it produces a, GSS, a GSH script which should fix your instance. I've included the wiki page for more information. The unresolvable subject deletion utility is used to find memberships and privileges in your grouper instance where the associated member is no longer resolvable um, in any of your subject sources. So for instance, it's possible for a person to have been added to a group sometime in the past. Later on, the person gets deleted from your subject source, which may be an LDAP or person registry, but the person continues to be a member of the group. You can run this utility to find memberships and privileges in that state and optionally delete them. Also, I've included the wiki page for this for more information. The next item is regarding logging. The main point I want to make here is that you may want to set up your Log4j configuration to send out emails when there are errors. For instance, in the UIs, if users are experiencing problems and errors are logged, you may want to know about it immediately. I've included a link here for our ongoing administration tasks wiki page, which includes an example Log4j configuration to send out emails. As an administrator of your group, for instance, one of the responsibilities that you likely have is creating new loader jobs. For instance, somebody in your institution may want to have a new group created that's automatically maintained based on data that you have in your LDAP person registry or data warehouse. By default, only grouper administrators can create loader jobs for security reasons, since otherwise end users would get access to run queries and get results back from your data sources. You can create new loader jobs from uh, the admin UI or using web services, or GSH. When you create a new loader job, at least as of Grouper 2.1, be sure to restart the Grouper daemon. The last topic um, I have here is about helping developers and architects. The first item here is granting access and delegating. As a Grouper admin, you have full access to the Grouper hierarchy and will often need to give others access. In the Grouper model, once you give somebody access to a portion of the namespace, that person can further delegate down the hierarchy. But as an admin, uh, you have to give the initial high-level rights. For instance, if you have part of your namespace dedicated for application-specific groups, then you may want to create a new application folder whenever a new application wants to use Grouper. 
you would then need to give the appropriate subjects access to that folder. In general, in many cases, it's probably a good practice uh, to have admin groups associated with the folders that you delegate. For instance, if there's a new application and you create the folder for that application uh, called App X, and there are 10 people that need access, uh, you may want to create a separate group that has the 10 members and associate that group as having full access to the App X folder. That way, groups and other folders created within that App X folder can reuse the same group for privileges. As an administrator, you will also likely have to help developers and architects with design. You'll probably have the best knowledge of what the overall namespace hierarchy looks like at your institution, so when there's a new use for a grouper, you'll probably have to be involved in terms of figuring out how to fit uh, the new application into your existing structure. Also, since admins are the only ones that can see the whole namespace, you would likely have to work with developers and architects to inform them with what exists and what doesn't when they're looking for new objects that they might not have access to yet. So that's all for this tutorial. Click on the quiz link in the video description to reinforce your knowledge of this topic. Here are some links uh, you can visit for more information. In the next video in the Grouper Online training for administrators is Grouper Advanced Topics. Thanks.